Hi everyone and welcome to part two of this still life in soft pastel. I hope that you've already watched part one of this so that where I'm picking up from here makes sense and if you haven't please do go back and check out that first part but in this part you'll see me finish off the yellow fabric and also work on a couple of the other objects within the composition. So I hope that you enjoy this. Part three will follow to complete the piece. So if you've tried painting before, I bet you have noticed that there's usually an ugly stage that your painting goes through. And it's easy to sometimes give up during that stage. But I've learned that it's worth battling on because almost every painting has to go through that stage. And you've got to work to bring it out the other side.
definitely got to show admiration to those artists who only ever work from life. 100% it is much harder than working from photo reference. Really good training for your eye. And I think if you did nothing but this for a few years your skills as an artist would certainly increase very quickly. I would certainly like to do some more. I'd love if you would let me know in the comments below this. If you'd like to see more of this type of project, is this helpful? And really up until this point I've been very busy with keeping commissioned work flowing. Really trying to make my living from my art, which sometimes leaves you very little time to experiment and take risks. And it's really thanks to the guys on my Patreon channel who are allowing me the luxury these days of taking a few risks and being a bit more experimental without worrying about uh, selling the artwork. So really working at toning down all of the green because there's just too much of that darker green there at the moment. It's a good base layer though for the shadow areas and now I can just start to bring in some more warmth in those parts.
really see it start to take a bit more shape now. I know I'm getting somewhere. making use of one of my favourite skirts just because I really like the flow of the fabric and of course the lovely vibrant colour too. So I really want to get this done so that I can wear my skirt again. It's one of my favourite skirts for this time of the year so what better motivation to get this done. So you don't have to have um, much stuff to hand to make use in a still life. You can be creative with it. Once you start to look around your house, you realise that pretty much everything could make an interesting still life. Items from the kitchen, different foods, although as I advised in that video, just be careful with perishable items. As if you plan to take a while, then your fruit may well have rotted by the time you finished. And that's why I've tried to keep this more simple. Not that it's feeling very simple right now, but I tried to keep it more simple using very geometric and non-perishable items. So this is actually a Prismacolor New Pastel. Got slightly harder edges on it, more squared off edges. Just using that in some of those little dark very shadowy places.
So just bringing in some of my brighter yellow highlight colour. Just heading a few little places over here where the light is reaching. Just noticing how the light catches the little dimples along the edge of the fabric here. So yeah, I'm starting to feel happier now about how the overall balance of this is looking. I think it's probably the part that's going to take me the longest out of the whole thing. I see the fabric as a really vital part of this. Nothing else is going to look right if I don't get the fabric to look pretty 3D. It really is the whole basis of the painting.
So I'm really looking forward to making a start on some of the objects once I get the fabric to a certain point. And I'll probably start with the tea canister just because it's, well, it's the biggest item. Also because it's in the background there. So that will probably be the first one. But I've got to say, so far it's really satisfying to work on. It probably won't be my best painting ever. And that's not what I'm expecting from this exercise. So don't always sit down expecting to create your best painting. It might not always happen. So at this point I've just had to overlay a little bit of audio. I had some neighbours using a strimmer or some kind of machine outside and it was making a lot of noise which the camera actually did manage to pick up. So I'll try and leave some of the audio in so that you can hear my marks being made. But just overlaying a little bit of audio to explain what I'm doing in these parts. I'm working over in this left side of the fabric where it's mostly in shadow. And I'm using that lovely lime green as my brightest highlight within the shadows. And then just bringing in little bits of yellow here and there to pick out where the light is actually catching. So this green colour created all of the brightest areas within the shadow. And I hope that you can see the contrast that that makes, especially down in this bottom left corner where the fabric is nicely draped over the edge of the desk. And I've also used lots of that lovely natural earth brown colour just to bring more warmth into the fabric. So between that and this uh, mid-tone lime green I think that really helped create the shadow effect of the yellow fabric. And again just making some more horizontal lines with my marks to try and create a little bit of the texture on the fabric. It's quite a silky sort of fabric which you can sort of tell from the way it drapes so nicely. And then also picking up that deliciously black Henri Rocher. And if you've seen my recent video about testing which black is the blackest within the pastel range, this black won by a long way. Um, the new pastel, Prismacolor new pastel, the little square edged black that I've also used in this piece, that was my winner initially. And then I got to try the Henri Rocher and their black is literally another level of black. So I used it there just to the left of the fabric um, to create a bit of extra dark shadow being cast from the cup on the wall of my um, still life setup. And also to create a little bit of shadow down the left side of the yellow fabric where it's uh, really casting some dark shadow on the black wall. So black, I'm always happy to use pure black and especially um, a few different actual uh, strengths of black. So in this piece I've used two or three different blacks just to get uh, even stronger shadow areas in some places. You can see how much colour I like to use as shadow colours but sometimes there is a use for pure black somewhere. So the desk that's in the foreground, I'm pretty happy with what I've done with the fabric at this stage. And I don't want to spend too long on the desk itself. Just want to get this pretty quickly blocked in and move on to the objects in the still life. 
It would be nice if you were going to spend more time on this to go right into creating the wood grain perhaps. But that's not my aim with this. I really just wanted to get this bottom corner blocked in. Get that nice warm colour from the desk. Which is also picking up some of the natural earths that I've used within the fabric. So again, using some of those similar colours to create the colour harmony throughout the piece. So the main area that I do spend a little bit of time on is just around that part where the fabric um, drapes over the edge of the desk. I really like the shadows that you're getting under those parts of the fabric. But beyond that I will just block in the rest of the desk and try and get the, the colour and the warmth of it to be pretty accurate. So just having a look at what colour I'm going to use as the brightest value on the desk. And I don't want that to be too bright. I really want to keep the lovely warmth that's coming from the desk with those orange tones. And also making sure that I leave that really dark shadow just in under the little curve of fabric there. And then really the main key with the actual mark making on this surface is to try and follow the perspective of the desk. So bringing my marks out in a diagonal direction down towards the bottom corner, following the front edge of the desk there and trying to let the, the marks that I make in the direction that I make them in sort of hint at the, the green of the wood and the perspective of the desk. So without going into super detail on the wood green, I can still give that effect a little bit just by making my marks in the direction that follows the perspective. So there's a lot you can do with soft pastel without going into huge amounts of detail, just to hint at something and sometimes that's enough. So as always, it's quite difficult to create these demos where I talk all the way through. There are any amount of things that might make me have to stop recording. Just external noises where I live. I'm surrounded by animals and busy people here doing laborious tasks outside. So you're inevitably going to get a bit of background noise. And usually I'm alright with the odd rooster crowing in the background or a dog barking in the distance. But in this case it was quite a loud streamer going the whole way through this section. So just overlaying this bit of audio.
but I know that it is quite nice when you get the sound of the pastel going onto the paper. And that varies a lot depending on the type of paper that you're using. The velour paper that I often use is really quiet because it's so soft. But I do quite like the scratch that you get from the pastel matte paper. And of course if you're using a more rough sanded paper it's going to be even noisier. So I think the pastel matte is a happy, happy medium. But it's nice just to hear the application of the pastel. And perhaps it gives you some idea of how heavily I'm leaning. As normally I'm not leaning very heavily at all. I tend to put the pigment onto the surface in quite thin layers so I'm not filling the tooth of the paper right away. Really working things up with very thin layers of pigment. And this is the black Prismacolor New Pastel that I spoke about. That's also a really good dark black. But even here you can see just how much darker that little area of the Henri Rocher is to the very left. So I love having a range of blacks. So just picking out the little edge along the desk here. Don't be afraid to turn your painting around to find a better angle at which to create a straight line like that. Or you can enlist the help of a ruler for things like that as well. I just go at that freehand usually. I don't mind if there's a little bit of a wobble in my straight lines. But just trying to do it quite smoothly in one go usually. And then just making sure that I darken down in that little section where the fabric just falls over that edge of the desk. So it's just like everything else looking for the light and shade. So pretty much done with the fabric I think, I'll leave it at that and I'm just going to quickly block in the rest of this desk before I move on to the first of the objects. So it would be nice to spend some time on this part of the foreground, perhaps add a little bit of the wood grain for example.
but I'm really not going to take the time on it. I really want to get on to some of the other objects. So maybe at the end I'll come back to this part and have a play with the wood grain effect. I'm happy enough just to get a bit of light and shade around the base of the fabric here, some of the shadows along the bottom. So just using the side of a pastel to give it a little bit of texture for now. One thing perhaps I can add in is a little bit of the cool reflection down this part. Just using a little bit of BV blue violet colour. In some of the objects you're going to see me pick this colour up now for the shadow work. So just a little bit of cool reflection running down the front of the wood here. So I'll reset my camera angle and the first object that I'm going to make a start on is this canister of tea. It's the biggest object and also it's behind both of these so it makes sense for me to start with that one. So I'm just going to firm up my outline of this again. And for the objects, you're going to see me pick up a little bit of pastel pencil. Now that I'm trying to get nice, crisp, sharp edges on some things, the pencils will become useful. So I've managed to do all of the background fabric, not needing the pencils really. But for anything really geometric in shape, with nice sharp edges, then those pencils become really useful. And of course there's a lovely amount of sheen and reflection on this canister so it's not just going to be solid black. So I'll start to block it in a little bit. Going for the areas first where I can see the darkest black. But of course, like anything that's shiny, there's going to be a lot of reflected colour happening. I 
and this is where you start to bring some 3D-ness or some life into what looks like very flat objects so far. And that really, to me, is the fun part. So very little of the lid itself is, or the top of the lid, is actually black. It really is reflecting a lot of the yellows from the fabric. very light covering of a bit of the black across some areas of it and then leaning a little bit heavier on some parts where the shadows are stronger but really trying to see what other colors are reflected first colour that I'm seeing around this rim is some of that lovely vibrant orange. Definitely a lot of warmth coming down the top of the lid here. So it looks really strong when I put the colour on. But of course I'm going to blend it in more. smooth finish. Even though I know it's a black object, there are so many other colours reflected off here other than just black. So really try and strain your eyes looking for what other colours you can see.
So like before, just trying to get it mainly blocked in first. Then on all the objects, I will make use of pastel pencil to come back in and really make some of the lines nice and crisp. Again, if you can hear a bit of snoring in the room with me, I've got one of the dogs in here having a snooze. So I haven't fallen asleep while I'm on the job. It's not me that you can hear. Hopefully it doesn't send you to sleep. Of course, some of the reflections should coordinate or coincide with what's going on above it. So where you find some bright colour, it's most likely that you'll find some of that reflecting directly below it. So just pay attention to how your objects are affected by the colours around them. And of course, we've also got little bits of highlight going on. One just below the rim here. And again, using nice sharp edges on the bigger sticks to get that. And then as well as that, we've got some brighter highlight just coming down this part. Our light source is coming from here. So now we're starting to see some of the, the brightest highlights. And that's really coming from directly from the light source.
those all the marks that I'm making just paying attention to the the cylindrical feel to this not forgetting the overall shape of the item Once I've got a little bit of colour in there, I can come back in with my darkest black value and just enhance some of the darkest parts again. So I'm really blending that in well, just to make it nice and smooth. And some areas for the little bits of reflection where I want it to be a bit more precise. Again, I can use some pastel pencil just to really crisp up the edges. I know that my ellipse shapes aren't going to be 100% perfect but I can help them a little bit with some pastel pencil. And for highlight areas especially, I've quite often got a similar colour pastel pencil ready just to neaten or enhance that little bit of highlight. Because the highlights are often the smallest area that you want and sometimes it's just too tricky with the bigger sticks. So I'm just going back over those blue-violet areas a little bit of my pastel pencil.
and pretty similar for the gold areas on the labels and on the canister itself. I'm looking for other colours there, not just gold and yellow colours. I'll just quickly get the rest of the dark parts of the canister blocked in. Hopefully that part of the teapot's going to stand out really nicely against that. And I'm also seeing a good dark shadow on this part of the canister being cast by the teapot itself. And it's handy to have this part still blank because I can also lean my hand there when I'm trying to get some of those precise shapes. That's one of the problems with soft pastel, not wanting to mess up the part that you've already worked on. And just using my yellow from the background to neaten that part again. So I'm not going to be bothering with the, the writing that's on the label. I'm really just going to block it in, go for the colours. And again, using similar colours to what I used in the yellow fabric for the gold areas. You can definitely see a lot of green reflecting off here as well. So it's definitely something worth practicing, ellipse shapes. Just getting a feel for how they sweep around an object.
And again, I'm just trying to get it blocked in. Then I can hopefully neaten it up with the pastel pencils. Just judging how far around the curve of this that the light is going. Not much further than that, it's really that green colour that I'm seeing coming around the corner. So I just want to darken down this first little bit of shadow behind the canister to help it pop out more. So really smoothing off the edges. You can see how it's possible now just to make those minor adjustments with the pastel pencils. Again, we've got our strongest bit of highlight coming down this part. So I like to work my way from top to bottom on most things. It makes sense usually because I've got somewhere to lean my hand that I haven't worked yet. And it just seems to be the natural way that things layer up. So from background to foreground and from top to bottom as a general rule.
So I'm just judging where those brightest highlights are and I can lean that little bit more heavily on those parts. Just coming back to this top one. Trying to lean a bit more heavily to create some more strength of pigment. So we're starting to get an idea of the light source coming from here. And now I just want to continue on down the piece, doing the same. Also looking to the shadow areas for where there might be a little bit of reflection over there too. Yellow is such a vibrant colour and it really does reflect onto everything. One of the reasons why I chose this lovely yellow fabric. So let's get the rest of the black just very lightly blocked in. Have a look at this area for some of those reflections. So really rubbing that quite hard to smooth it in, get a nice smooth appearance to it. Really think about the texture of the item that you're painting. I can see a nice gold stripe of reflection coming down here in a straight line. here. And a really fine one just going down this edge, leaving a little black strip closest to the yellow fabric. 
So I really do love shiny objects. That's why I chose a few shiny objects to paint in this. So interesting when you get good light. Just really trying to neaten or crisp up those edges, which is tricky. And really what I want to do it with is this blackest value. So just really taking my time with that being careful. I can also neaten it up from the other side a little bit. I'm not too concerned if I don't get the lines absolutely perfectly straight. It's tricky when you do choose geometric shapes because they've got so many straight lines, perfect ellipses, etc. But I'm not too concerned if I don't get it 100% after all. It's a painting and I don't mind if some of the lines show a little bit of uh, my wonkiness. <laughs> Again, that brightest highlight being continued on down the canister. Well, the gold label itself just 
just dealing with the overall colour of it first. I don't mind if I smudge over the lines of the objects in front a little bit. In fact, that's going to help when I come to put the colour on them, that they really look like they're sitting in front. So that's what I'm really going for. So don't worry if you go over your lines a little bit. You can still faintly see those lines through it. So it really is quite dark on a lot of this label. We're really wearing the corner in the shadows here. So thinking about the shadow colours that I used in the yellow of the fabric.
And there's just a little bit of light catching down this one side of the label. with the soft pastel and then use my pencils to tweak it into the right place. purposefully tilted my label around out of the light because I really don't want to be bothered doing the, the writing on it. I also don't want any uh, copyright issues with my painting should the brand of tea that I'm painting dislike the fact that I've used their brand another thing you have to be careful of sometimes if you're doing still life. Recently saw a friend on social media painting a very popular drinks label and when she asked their permission they said that she could paint it but not sell it so be careful of the items that you choose to paint whether you're infringing the copyright of a brand. Actually not show any branding in my paintings. As I would prefer to not have that hassle. So it really is quite dark in here because we're obviously getting some shadows cast from the teapot. Um, the darker I can make it in there the better because the more my nice light coloured teapot will show up in front of that. So yeah, main advice, don't be scared to go really dark in certain areas. It will only help the overall effect. Having good dark contrast somewhere in a painting is always very effective.
So yeah, the most I'm going to do is just a little uh, few bits of scribbles to hint at there being some writing on the label. So yeah, that's close to finished. Yep, I think I'll leave the canister at that. Again, I would like to help it stand out a little bit more on this side. Perhaps just darken down this shadow behind it a little bit more, closest to the canister. but I'm reasonably happy with that. So yeah, let's move on to the next item. So the first thing I'll do again, like with the canister, is just uh, find my outline again. Again, I'm not too concerned if my ellipses are perfect, but I've tried my best with them. <laughs> if you haven't already, do make sure that you go and check out part two of this series where I give you all my best tips and show you me sketching this out from life. There are a few methods that will help with that. But it's still a tricky thing to do, so my ellipses are by no means perfect. So the teacup is quite a tricky object. The canister really was the, the easiest of the three objects. Is possibly the teapot being the trickiest but this mug or cup of tea is definitely not simple. A lot of reflections going on and the two-tone colour as well to deal with. 
and of course that lovely tea inside. But it should be nice because it's the first bit of lighter colour that we've got going on in the portrait or in the still life. So we've got some whites for the first time, which of course aren't going to be white. This lovely shadow that's cutting across the inside of the cup. Of course I'm trying to use mostly the colours that I've used in the background. That's one of my best tips for painting most things just to help with the colour harmony. Try and make your colour palette be the thing that unites the whole painting. So using the same colours in your objects as in the rest of the painting. That's a great way to bring some colour harmony into your work. So again, it's got a lot of black on it, but with a lot of things reflected in it.
So just experimenting now with how bright I should go in some of the white parts of the cup. So much yellow light being reflected around so the whites really do look very yellow to me. So coming in with a really pale yellow tint and I even feel like it's a little bit too bright. I want really to leave room to go brighter where I need to add highlights on this. But I can always tone it down as I blend it in a bit. Again, just like black objects, white objects tend to reflect a lot of the colours around them. So we're definitely going to get a lot of yellow within the whites. So just really working at that ellipse shape on this side. Again, I can also use some colour from the canister behind. It's quite dark where the two of these meet, but the canister really should be ever so slightly lighter to help the cup stand out. So that's what I'm doing here, just lightening that and helping to shape the cup a little better.
So I want to bring in this lovely blue-violet colour that's going to feature on lots of the teapot surfaces. Really nice shadow colour and it's particularly nice in this painting because of all of that lovely yellow So this colour just serving as a nice sort of colour opposite. Something complimentary. And always, always if you can add some complimentary colours to the shadows it's really going to enhance it. So again, just working at the outer edges of the elliptical shape. Trying to even it up a little bit. And then of course, even the reflections inside the cup are coming around 
in that elliptical shape as well at the edges so all of that should follow through on the areas that are in sunlight or in lamp light and lots of cool colors within the shadows just on this one area of what is actually a white cup and there's anything but white on here Don't worry if you don't get it on correctly with your soft pastel. Make use of those pencils afterwards then. Just to shape it into place. To me it's still better to put it down with bigger sticks because you get so much more strength to your colour. So the brightest little part being just a little fleck of highlight. And we've also got a couple on the blue part. If you don't make the surrounding areas dark enough, it's going to be hard to get your punchy little highlights to really stand out.
out. I'll start a bit of the saucer as well here just before working any further on the tea. Get a little bit more blocked in before I start to add any more detail to that. really the trickiest part on this is these little edges. It's quite difficult to talk actually when you're trying to almost hold your breath to get these crisp little lines. So I'm a bit quieter than normal in this tutorial. Definitely more tricky to talk as I work on this. So again, you can see that it goes a bit messy at times. And I'm trying to get those finer edges. But it's very easy just to neaten that into the right shape afterwards. Again, the main thing is to get the real strength of pigment on there with the soft pastels. It's at this point really that it becomes most difficult to keep those nice flowing elliptical shapes when you're trying to create these sharp little edges. But that's the nice thing about pastel, you can just keep working at it until it behaves itself and gets into the right place where you want it. It's extremely versatile. It likes being moved around so you don't have to get it on there correctly the first time. Just keep pushing at the pigment.
until you have it how you want it. So just picking up a little bit of one of my dark Terry Ludwigs to help me out a little bit with the colour of the tea. Lovely rich dark pigments from these pastels. And perhaps just a little bit of this um, dark from Unison as well, just to bring a bit more red into the tea. Really is a lovely rich colour of tea. We've also got a lovely sharp reflection across the tea here. Just the mug edge of the mug being reflected in it. And hopefully that's going to help give us the effect of this being a reflective liquid in here.
and this is the light grey pastel pencil that I'm using here just to brighten up a few of the highlights around the edges of the cup. just to bring another little bit of light into the colour of the cup, even in the shadow areas. I always find it's kind of better to go too dark first, as you can always lighten it up later. But if you haven't got those dark colours down, then it's quite difficult to come back in afterwards and add them in. Much easier to tone them down as you go. such dramatic lighting like with this lamp that I'm using. I really do want to try and replicate that in the painting. And that just involves being a little bit more brave with the colour choices. that once I get the black part of the cup done, these other parts will start to look a bit lighter.
So yeah, as suspected, the cup and saucer are very tricky. Very difficult just to see the correct colour values on this. Your brain tells you that it's one colour. But your eyes are seeing so many different colours in front of you. And I'm really trying to listen to my eyes, not my brain. And it feels as though uh, I could really sit and stare at this for quite a while in between making marks but I'm conscious of the camera going too so if you're working on something like this you really need to spend just as long observing as actually putting down pigment trying to just keep it more fluent for the purposes of the camera. But I advise taking lots of breaks, step back from painting lots of times throughout your process. don't rush it. And on that note, this is the end of part two. I hope that you've enjoyed watching and I hope that you'll call back and watch part three where I complete the painting. <laughs>